This episode of Liquor and Literature deals with themes of mental health issues and suicidal ideation. We, as hosts of this podcast, strive to have conversations about these topics in healthy and understanding ways. We do not take mental health issues or suicide lightly and do not condone deriving humor and entertainment from other struggles. The 988 Suicide and Crisis Lifeline is here for anyone who is in need of help. Please dial 988 or visit 988lifeline.org if in a crisis or need more information. Also, cuss words are a part of our regular vocabulary and drinks will be had. So keep that in mind if you are sensitive to liquored up loud mouths. Welcome to Liquor and Literature. We are a podcast, a book club, and a happy hour. Uh, I'm Lauren. I'm Amber. And I'm Sam. And uh, yeah, just once a month we're going to read a book and kind of discuss the history of the author and then a bunch of talking points and then any kind of, you know, movie adaptation that comes with it. So... There will be spoilers. There will be spoilers, yes. FYI, I mean, we are a book club, so it's kind of, you know... Given, but there are going to be spoilers, so if you want to read the book before listening, go ahead and do that. If you don't want to read and you just want to listen, that's fine, too. You do you. Also, fair warning, obnoxious laughter. Yes. Yeah. Obnoxious laughter. So (laughs) maybe not listen it with your headphones, but, you know, we'll let you decide. (laughs) So this month, what book are we doing? The Bell Jar by Sylvia Plath. And with that, we are going to be doing a drink pairing. What would the drink pairing be? Um, So it's a recipe I found called Vintage Rose, but I tweaked it because that's what I do. Um, It's originally done with 1908 Empress Gin, but I decided that we're not going to do that because gin is not my friend. So I changed it up and decided to go with a vodka based drink because in the book esther decides that she thinks that vodka is her drink so we're using kettle one's grapefruit and rose vodka fever trees pink grapefruit um sparkling tonic i guess it's technically and then a prosecco rose along with a little splash of lime juice and hummingbird bitters by Old Forester, and that's a rose and citrus bitter. And then just mix it all up and have a really refreshing pale pink drink, and you can garnish it with dried rose petals. And for our sober listeners, because we are huge advocates of mental health, we have a drink for you too. We have the same drink, but the virgin style, half bottle of Fever Tree Sparkling Pink Grapefruit Tonic, with a half um, Welch's Sparkling Rosé and a dash of lime juice. Um, then you can garnish it with dried roses, rose petals, if you're feeling fancy. <laughs> <laughs> we, we're really proud of you guys if you are staying sober. Great job. So now we're going to go through a brief synopsis of the book, um, just to let you guys know kind of what it's about. The Bell Jar is about... A lovely young um, college girl, Esther Greenwood, who is in New York on scholarship. She's a writer. She's very successful. All of this stuff. She goes back home and it's just about her slow descent to madness. um, And then kind of some of the mental health stuff that goes along with that. Yeah, it's basically like a coming of age book, but with a lot more mental health issues and stuff. Yes, but also tinged with that 50s mentality of what a woman should be. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. See, this is why we work together. (laughs) (laughs) Teamwork. Okay. (laughs) So I guess we're going to start off with Amber with the history of kind of Sylvia Plath and all that jazz. Sylvia Plath was born October 27th, 1923 in Boston, Massachusetts to Otto and Aurelia Plath. Her father was a professor of German and biology with a focus on apiology, which is the study of bees. There's a lot of references to bugs in the book, which is interesting. Her mother taught a medical secretary program. Sylvia published her first poem at the age of eight. 
Her father also died when she was eight of complications related to diabetes. He was an authoritarian, and the poem Daddy, which was not published until 1965 in a complica- compilation of her poetry titled Ariel, is about him. She moved in with her mother, younger brother, and grandparents after her father's death. Her father was a maitre d', which is also discussed in the book. She was published in the Christian Science Monitor in 1950, just after high school. She graduated Smith College, summa cum laude, which means she received her degree with the highest honor. She moved to Cambridge, England on Fulbright Scholarship, and then she was hospitalized for severe depression in 1953 after attempting suicide. This is discussed pretty heavily in the book. Um, She met Ted Hughes, another poet, in early 1956 and she married him in june of 1956 so their marriage last or their relationship lasted like six months before they got hitched in 1957 she moved to massachusetts her first collection of poems was published in a book called colossus in 1960 in england then later in the united states she returned to england and had a daughter frida in 1960 and after the birth of frida she actually suffered a miscarriage And then she had an appendectomy. Then she had her son, Nicholas, in 1962. In 1962, Hughes left Plath for, I think her name is, Asia Gutman Weevil, who (laughs) he allegedly had a daughter with. Plath wrote most of the poems that would become the compilation Ariel during her separation from Ted. In 1962... Sylvia burned a book she'd been working on, which is tragic because that is a beautiful piece that we will never get to see. The Bell Jar was published in London by William Heinemann Limited, January 14th, 1963 in England, under the pseudonym Victoria Lucas. Sylvia Plath reportedly did not consider the Bell Jar series work, questioned its literary value, and considered it may cause pain to people whose personalities she distorted in the novel. Sylvia Plath committed suicide February 11th, 1963. Her son Nicholas committed suicide in 2009. The woman Ted Hughes was having an affair with committed suicide and tragically ended the life of her own child in a way that morbidly mimicked Sylvia's own death. Sylvia's daughter, Frida, was studying to be a bereavement counselor in 2014, but I couldn't find no further updates regarding that story. She has also published several children's books and several poems, and she is a painter. Ted Hughes died of cancer. I mean, there's a lot to dig into with that biography because specifically, I think the bell jar is very closely, I mean, based off of her life. It is her life. And basically every character in that book is supposed to be someone that she interacted with in real life. Yep. And Who do you think Ted Hughes would have been? I kind of think he's. I kind of think, think he's, he's Buddy in some ways. Yeah, I think so too. I could see Buddy, but I could also potentially see Marco. Maybe. Ooh. Mm. Is he the man hater guy? He the is man, woman hater guy. <laughs> yep. Yes. He is. Yeah. Yeah. Because I feel like. And like, I just might be pulling this out of my own butt, but I feel like I've also heard that Ted Hughes has been physically abusive with her at points. Obviously very much emotionally abusive, but Mm -hmm. yeah. The points that you made in your biography are directly related to a lot of her poems. And there are specific ones in particular that I can think of that are completely directly related. Um, And I found that like reading her poetry, there's a lot of talk about her father. It's a very big subject, Um, love, but not necessarily like in a way that, I don't wanna say this. It's not like it's promoting like love is great and whatever love is torture uh, essentially to her. Um, There's also a lot of imagery about bees Mm-hmm. which again re- directly relates to her father um, and just nature in general. So I feel like there's a lot of things that came up in her life that she's obviously pulling from in her poetry and within the bell jar itself too. Mm-hmm. 
whenever Esther's dad is brought up in the bell jar, it's kind of like, oh, well, my mom never talks about him or Mm -hmm. ever grieved him. And there's like a point in it, I think towards the end, where she actually goes to a jail and wants to visit him even though he's not there. And I don't think he's probably ever been in jail. Yeah, that that was such a weird thing. I think that was a weird way for her to try to get in the jail to like, I don't know, maybe ask for help or feel like she needed to be within a cell. I think that's a lot of what it was, was she felt like she was so far gone that she needed to be isolated from the rest of the world Mm -hmm. because she was just losing her mind. And that was her excuse was, oh, I need to go find my dad. Yeah. Let me go to this jail where I might feel safer. Yes. You know. Mm -hmm. What do you guys think were some some of the main themes that were kind of brought up in the book? Well, maybe it's not really a theme, but so I was talking to my aunt a couple months ago being like, oh, we're going to start this podcast. And uh, the first book is going to be The Bell Jar. And her reaction was, what? That book from the 60s? Like, she was, like, surprised that we wanted to do it. I'm like, yeah, it's, like, a really relevant book still. And there was a quote from the forward of the book that we all are, the copy that we have, which I think is, like, a, I don't remember when this one came out. 2005 was the last time it was um, actually published. Yes. Well, uh, there's a forward at the beginning by Frances McCullough. And I thought this quote that she said was really interesting. She said, the novel was pre-drugs, pre-pill, pre-women's studies in the survivalist mode of the 90s. When I asked an informal focus group of bright young women in their 20s what they thought of the book, they were unanimous. They loved it. The issues they pointed out haven't changed. So it, it kind of like, I think it goes to the fact of like, Sylvia Plath was kind of ahead of her time when she was talking because, you know, they Very. didn't talk about pregnancy back in the day. They didn't talk about sex or just if you did not want to be a mom, like that was a bad taboo thing. And she covered all that and more and mental illness. Like that was something that people didn't understand. And she was she wrote about it in a first person way that was very, I think, kind of grabs you in and makes you really feel for the character because you see how these cracks are forming in her life and how her downfall actually happened. Then you're like, oh, well, that makes sense that that happened because of all this pressure to be the woman that everyone wants her to be, you know? Mm -hmm. I think my biggest pull from it was how she was so adamant about not really wanting to be married, to have kids, things like that. But she also knew almost that she had to because that's what society suspected. You had to do this to be a woman, quote unquote, during that time. And I just, she also had so many instances of women within the book that were completely against that. But she almost made them sound like they, because of that, they were lesbians. Uh And I was just like, especially near the end when, when like Joan was, being talked about which i think joan probably was a lesbian yeah there was like that scene with her in dd yeah yeah Yeah. (laughs) but like obviously i don't feel like all of the women were lesbians and you know whatever obviously at the time that was like not okay but like you know today it's okay and it's fine but like i feel like it was very new and very raw and not accepted and so i thought it was really interesting that that was a reoccurring theme that kept coming up Mm -hmm. well and also esther probably feels more comfortable with women than she does men because every single man that she encounters in that book is horrible (laughs) yeah (laughs) there's different (laughs) levels of horribleness but they all with the exception of one yeah with the exception of one one yes the interpreter constantine yep yes and I did a compare and contrast on Constantine yep. and Mark, okay? <laughs> yeah. Oh my god, that probably wasn't hard the, at all. The one man, <laughs> the one man that was nice and a gentleman and did not sleep with her. We'll go through that later. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, um, some of the general themes that I pulled, of course, were uh, obviously depression, um, and then the treatment of mental illness at the time, which is really big for me. I'm a nurse, and I like psych. That's my favorite thing. So I really focused pretty heavy on that treatment of mental illness at the time and how people interacted with her within each of the two facilities she was in. And then what being a woman meant 
um, sex, marriage, and like maternal instincts was something that I picked up mm-hmm. on pretty heavily in there too. Yeah. So I'm really excited about talking about this book. Um, there was also today before you guys came over, I went on a bike ride and I was like, oh, I want to get into, you know, get into the mode of doing this podcast. So I actually listened to another podcast that was kind of just talking about Sylvia Plath's life. Um, it's called Nation of Writers and it's from the American Writers Museum podcast. And they interviewed Heather Clark, who I guess just wrote a, a biography about um, Sylvia Plath. And she said two things that really caught me. And one was she she said that The Bell Jar is a protest novel. Which that makes I, sense. Yeah. yeah. I'm like, yeah, she was protesting a lot of stuff. And like, mm-hmm. also Sylvia was kind of, she was kind of political. She danced between being political and being not political. But if she was alive today, she'd probably definitely be a lot more political, I think, because mm-hmm. she'd feel like she'd have more power as a woman too. And then the other thing um, Heather Clark said was, to pose the question of, well, was Esther, did she originally struggle with all this mental illness, like from birth or whatever, or did it happen because of society making that happen to her? And I think it could be both, you know, she could have been struggling with stuff, but I think just society pushed her over the edge to a certain degree, you know, because it's like, oh, I think she had to a lot of factors. Yeah. Like, yeah. you know, especially losing a parent that young mm-hmm. and an authoritarian parent where they basically tell you what to think and feel. And then that's gone. And her mother is obviously not that aggressive. And she doesn't, she's one of the people that are like to put their head in the sand and pretend everything's okay. So, so much to say about her mother. (laughs) (laughs) I wrote a spiel about that too. Yeah. So I feel like it's probably started like at a, a younger age and maybe she just never realized it. And then the events in New York just kind of spiraled it out of control and it just built upon and built upon and built upon layers and it just she came to a break and that's I mean that's not abnormal that's pretty normal for Mm -hmm. mental illness and people who end up having breakdowns especially because I feel like um people in their early 20s any kind of 20s I feel like that's a big time for people to have mental issues or for those issues to come about because it's just it's a very weird time in your life when you're trying to figure yourself out and trying to be an adult but you're not an adult like even though everyone oh, says sh- you're an adult you're no. not an adult there's no way no you <laughs> yeah. don't know what the hell you're I doing still when you're like in your early adult, 20s and i'm 34. yeah, yeah. same yeah same <laughs> okay since we brought up her mom <laughs> <laughs> I have so much to say about her mom, but I, I have a big spiel about all of that. So in the book, when Esther gets back from New York, the first thing her mother says to her after asking about the blood stains on her face is, I think I should tell you right away, you didn't make that writing course. <laughs> like, by the way, hi, you failed. <laughs> Like, what the hell is that? I was really upset about that. Like, that's her relationship with her mom is, hey, what's that on your face? Hi, you failed. But I feel like that's very typical of (sighs) women and mothers at that time. Like, maybe it's not necessarily her downfall, but it's just how she is because that's how women are. You have to be presentable and just deal with your own emotions to yourself, which is not healthy. And the fact that education really wasn't a huge deal, you were basically going to college to find a husband. Mm-hmm. Which is screwed up. <laughs> but yes. Yeah. Like I mean, that's college. how it was. Yeah, that is yeah. how it was. <laughs> like you basically go to college to find a husband. It doesn't matter what you're majoring in because yeah. you're just going to be a housewife. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. Here, get all this education so you can meet a nice rich man and hopefully settle down and produce a whole bunch of babies. Pop mm-hmm. them babies up. Jesus, what a terrible time. (laughs) She was also really passive. Um, There's like a point where Esther's clearly really depressed. Like she says she hadn't bathed in like... Seven days? Seven days. She hadn't washed her hair in that time. 
And she hadn't washed her clothes in two weeks. And I'm like, girl, if I don't wash my hair in like two days, it is nasty. Yeah. She's like, and she's like, seven I, days. I had this really <laughs> friendly, sour smell about me. And I'm like, girl, you smelled like a barn. <laughs> like, I know you did. Poor honey. But and you know she didn't change her sheets. But her love, <laughs> Jesus. And her mom was so passive. She's like, why, honey? Don't you want to get dressed? My mother never took my mother took care never to tell me to do anything. She would only reason with me sweetly like one intelligent mature person with another. Like that's not a mom. That's not a mom. It's like hey, you smell like a farm. Why don't you get out of bed and take a bath and maybe clean your clothes, honey? Like, you're not taking care of yourself, and I see that enough to tell you that. I love you. Please take care of yourself. Why are we skating around the edges of this very clear issue that she had? Well, and she's obviously depressed, because it's like, when you're depressed, you don't want to shower. You don't Like, when she was describing that she had not taken a shower and washed her hair in seven days, whatever, I'm like, yeah, I mean, that is a very good way of saying that Esther was depressed and maybe not realizing she was, and that's not the way to help her is doing what her mom did you no, know like no. ugh, it's it's like her mom doesn't realize really what's going on she sees that her daughter is struggling with something but she's, she's like oh well it'll just pass well, she doesn't really think of it as like a whole thing yeah i mean even after she had her first shock treatment um with dr gordon she was like i knew you weren't one of those people <gasps> I and i was like are you kidding like there's oh, a, my God. Thing. I'm finding that quote because I have that in here. Because I was like, oh, I knew my baby wasn't like that. Mm -hmm. I looked at her like what? Like those awful people, those awful dead people at that hospital. She paused. I knew you decide to be all right again. Like... Like what? You can just snap out of depression. You just decide to be fine. I was so mad about it. And we can be mad about that because we understand it way better now. Right. Than like their, her parent would have been. Because, like, you know, for such a long time that mental illness was never talked about. It was not acceptable. You just, like the older generation likes to say, pull yourself up by the bootstraps. Well, I'm sorry, but... Not everyone's brain can do that. Mm -hmm. And I feel like that was like that generation kind of showing that. So like sometimes I can give her mom a pass because it was like she doesn't even know any better because psychology was still like a very evolving thing at that point. But at the same time, please have more empathy for your child. She literally just had like hundreds of volts thrown through her body and her head and it's like and you're like i knew you weren't like them those crazy mm -hmm. people like how dare you i don't know i just i i'm very torn about her mom well she's trying to help but she's not doing it in the right ways you mm -hmm. know she's, okay so there's like this incident in the hospital after she had attempted suicide um and her face is all swollen and really messed up and the nurse hands her a mirror and she breaks said mirror um, she's be she gets transferred to another unit and she didn't really want to be transferred to another mo mo unit and she says as much and there's a quote here that says my mother's mouth tightened you should have behaved better then like like it's her fault like it's her fault yeah. that she did this even though that probably wasn't the most therapeutic for that nurse to hand her the well, mirror in the first place. And I think yeah. another nurse said that. I told you not to show her the yeah. mirror, you know. There was that exchange. And there was a lot of messed up stuff in that particular hospital. Like, the state hospital did her so many injustices. Um, like, there's that whole thing with the, like, thermometer where that other, like, the nurse put the thermometers down at the bottom of a mentally ill patient's bed. And it was mad. And yeah, and yeah. She and upset she, them. <laughs> she kicked them over. And yes, she did do it intentionally. And it was very clear she did it intentionally. But the nurse was like, I can't believe you do that. Okay, I can't believe that a nurse with the knowledge that there's a mentally ill patient in that bed would put a 
thing full of glass thermometers full of mercury at the end of that patient's bed. I'm a nurse and I would never, ever put glass anything even near a patient that had mental health issues because there could be problems. But this, again, was the 50s where not a whole lot was known and it's very frustrating. But yeah, like they get onto her about it. There's a lot of... mm, there's a lot of really messed up stuff about that hospital. Isn't that the scene where the thing does break and then Esther like takes the mercury and plays with it? And yes. I was like, oh my God, don't do that. Yeah. <laughs> like, so- you don't know what you're doing. So there's like two scenes though where she talks about mercury and I was like, why is she so obsessed with mercury? I thought she was going to ingest it. I'm not going to lie. So there's that. But I also kind of wonder if it's a like reflection thing. So she talks about seeing herself in this ball of mercury where she's got this really distorted image of herself because of the ball of mercury and what she looks like in it. And so I'm kind of wondering if it's a self-reflection thing. Is she seeing through this? Like, is it a metaphor for how she sees herself at that time? I think it possibly could be because she talks about how it, if you drop it, it'll separate and then come back together. Yes. Mm -hmm. And that her image is really distorted in it. And like, so she's got a really distorted state of mind anyway, like her mental health views. And so like, I just thought it was interesting that she was so obsessed with like, there was twice that she talked about it. There was, like, the dental... There's, like, a dentist mercury. Something about the fillings. It's, yeah. yeah. They used to use mercury and... Fi- oh, my God. I said mercury. They still do. <laughs> really funny. I but I used to use it in fillings, yeah. Um, which I just... I kept thinking about, like, the whole Mad Hatter thing because they used to use mercury yeah. when yes. they would make hats uh-huh. and haberdasheries. And that's what would make people go crazy. And I was like, honey, you don't need to be touching that. <laughs> right. <laughs> you don't need help. You know. You're there, babe. I need to refill. I'm almost there. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to take a quick break. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> Well, we are back with more drinks, and uh, we're going to kick things off again with Sam reading a poem from Sylvia. (laughs) So this one is called Electra on Azalea Path, and it's actually about her father. Um, It actually almost directly reflects to the book um, when she goes and finds his grave and cries at her his grave and she talks about how she'd never even been there the family hadn't even been there since his death she never went to his funeral and things like that so we will start that one and it doesn't say most of the time they say the year so let me see if i can find that really quick it's 1959 when she wrote this one it's a little long but here we go the day you died i went into the dirt into the lightless hiberneculum where bees, bees, <laughs> striped black and gold, sleep out the blizzard like heretic stones and the ground is hard. It was good for 20 years, that wintering, as if you had never existed, as if I came, God fathered into the word from my mother's belly. Her wide bed worn the satin of divinity. I had nothing to do with guilt or anything. When I wormed my way back under my mother's heart, Small as a doll in my dress of innocence, I lay dreaming of your epic image by image. Nobody died or withered on that stage. Everything took place in durable whiteness. The day I woke, I woke on Churchyard Hill. I found your name, I found your bones and all. Enlisted in a camped necropolis, your speckled stone askew by an iron fence. In this charity ward, this poor house where the dead crowd foot to foot Head to head, no flower. Breaks the soil, this is Azalea Path. A field of burdock opens to the south. Six feet of yellow gravel cover you. The artificial red sage does not stir. And the basket of plastic evergreens they put at the headstone next to yours. Nor does it rot. Although the rains dissolve a bloody dye, the earth's petals drip and they drip red. Another kind of redness bothers me. The day your slack sail drank my sister's breath, the flat sea purpled like that evil cloth, my mother unrolled at your last homecoming. I borrow the stilts of an old tragedy. The truth is, one late October at my birth cry, 
A scorpion stung its head, an ill-starred thing. My mother dreamed you face down in the sea. The stony actors poise and pause for breath. I brought my love to bear, and then you died. It was the gangrene, ate you to the bone. My mother said, you died like any man. How shall I age into that state of mind? I am the ghost of an infamous suicide. My own blue razor resting in my throat. Oh, pardon the one who knocks for pardon at your gate father, your hound bitch daughter friend. It was my love that did us both to death. Dang. It's wild. Yeah. I'd never read any of her poetry before, so this is really interesting to kind of like see what her poetry was like and then also like after reading the bell jar see how they kind of you know intertwine i actually have the quote here um about that whole scene in the book where she goes to see her father's grave Mm -hmm. it says my mother hadn't let us come to his funeral because we were only children then so it kind of talks about how her mother responded to the death too so this is about her mom too (laughs) um And he had died in the hospital, so the graveyard and even his death had always seemed unreal to me. I couldn't understand why I was crying so hard. Then I remembered that I had never cried for my father's death. My mother hadn't cried either. She had just smiled and said what a merciful thing it was for him that he had died. Because if he had lived, he would have been crippled and and an invalid for the rest of his life, and he couldn't have stood that. He would have rather died than have had that happen. I totally highlighted that quote, too. I have it in my notes. So apparently we both thought that was pretty significant. Yeah. I think it's interesting, too, because you said he died of complications with diabetes. And in the poem, she mentions gangrene, which obviously Mm -hmm. happens to a lot, particularly men, because they do not take care of their feet. I was about to say, my first first thought was diabetic foot ulcer when you said he had a gangrene. I was like, he had a diabetic foot ulcer. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And he probably got staph or something that just continued his system. Lesson learned, take care of your feet, Mm y'all. Especially if you're diabetic, please check your feet every day. If something's weird, please go to your doctor. Yes. Notify your local physician. Mm -hmm. (sighs) Yeah, but I also think it's really funny because, okay, so she may her mom makes it out that you know being an invalid or a cripple is like the worst thing for this man to have happened to him or whatever. So it's better that he's dead. And I think that's just I'm sorry, bullshit. I mean, you can definitely be a professor on crutches or in a wheelchair, y'all. Yeah, my father was a double amputee. He no. didn't have legs, like. He lived a full life. He had a full job. Like, he did everything, you know, and he had his legs amputated um, when he was 21. Yeah. It's like, why was her mother so, like, stuck on this? Or maybe it was just the type of man her father was. Or maybe, just maybe, it was one of these, I have to be strong and stoic for my children and put on a brave face bullshit that or women maybe, tended to do. Maybe she was glad he was gone. Dude, that's what I mean. <laughs> If he was that of a, much of authoritarian, yeah. maybe she was like, Peace. Yeah. Like I'm glad. I'm Thanks so glad you're he's dead. down. Yeah. <laughs> that could have been a thing though, because women didn't divorce their husbands back at this time. And she didn't want to take yeah. care of him. No. Yeah. And so if okay, so Hester was I think it was 1953 when she was institutionalized. And if that's the case, then she like what, ten years prior to that. So this was in the forties. Yeah. Most so like, it would have been but, World War Two. Yeah, like women did area. not leave their husbands because no. the husbands were the providers. Period. They beat you. You're just gonna have to deal yep. with it. Mm-hmm. Sorry, mm, that's terrible. But yeah, that's yeah. a very valid point. Maybe yeah. she didn't want to. Like maybe she's like, yeah, he's she's like, gone. thank God, I don't have to deal with that yeah. now. Like, and maybe that's why she didn't mourn him because she didn't. It really wasn't a mourning, you she know. Was like hooray, he's gone. Or I mean, she could have just mourned him in private too. Yeah, true. But Again, it's kind of weird certain. because didn't her and her like didn't Esther and her mom share the same bedroom, which I thought was a very odd, by the way. It. I think there there was a t- yeah because they were talking about how she. I have a quote. <laughs> <laughs> I was just like, girl, you got your room. So. <laughs> 
So there was like, she does. She does share a room. And she clearly hated her mother. And there's this <laughs> moment. There's this moment where Esther had suicide, like, or sorry. <clears throat> she had homicidal ideation about her mom. She says, my mother turned from a foggy log into a slumbering middle-aged woman. Her mouth slightly open and a snore raveling from her throat. The piggish noise irritated me, and for a while it seemed to me that the only way to stop it would be to take the column of skin and sinew which it, from which it rose and twist it to a silence between my hands. Yeah, she shared a room with her mom, and she had to hear, like, voracious snoring. This was after she moved back home before yes. her suicide attempt. And there's like yes. a yeah, weird so. moment too where they talked about, there's two moments where they talked about, she's like, I'd never spent more than a week. At, I made it a point never to spend more than like a week yeah. with my mom mm-hmm. at her home. Um, and then there's this other point um, in the book where Esther is being released back from the whole thing. I'm trying to find this quote. Are you talking about the, like the Here roses? There's this little segment that says, Dr. Nolan said my college would take me back for the second semester on her recommendation and Philomena Guinea's scholarship. But as the doctors vetoed my living with my mother in the interim, I was staying on at the asylum until the winter term began, which indicates to me that the psychologist didn't think her relationship with her mother was very healthy either. Well, at one point she says she hates her mom. Yeah, Yeah. she does. And Dr. Nolan was like, yep. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, she's like, I suppose that's another thing. I have that quote. My mother was the worst. She never scolded me, but kept begging me with a sorrowful face to tell her what she had done wrong. I hate her, I said, and waited for the blow to fall. But Dr. Nolan only smiled at me as if something had pleased her very, very much and said, I suppose you do. Mm-hmm. <laughs> well, and then there's a point where like her mom comes to visit her on her birthday in the uh, yep. place and... So, Esther basically yeah. like throws the roses away that she gives her and is like, go away. And her mom's like, oh, it's your birthday. And she's like, I don't want to see you. Like, And then after that, she didn't have any more visitors yeah. except for the rare instance that Buddy actually came to visit her. And even then, it was like very weird. Mm-hmm. Um, I found that was interesting because he was like, well, who's going to marry you now? That is my like yeah. least favorite quote of the entire freaking book and I wrote about that too. I was so... And I was like, bro, you were all up in her grill and she wasn't even interested and now you're like, well, who's going to marry you now that you've been crazy? And I'm like, dude, go fuck yourself, okay? His, Nobody wants you either. <laughs> that's his final line in the book is asking Mester, Esther who she'll marry now since she's been here. And he's at the facility. And I yeah. was just like, at listen, the, you the asi- You've been in the asylum. <laughs> Come on. Well, and Come also on. it just shows how selfish he is because, mm-hmm. well, maybe not selfish isn't the right word. He is selfish, but this might not be the right word for what I'm trying to think of because He's um, self-interested friend, no matter what. Well, her friend also went into the asylum and he dated her friend too. And one oh. of the first questions he asks her is, am I the reason why you guys became crazy? You're like, if that like, is fault, bro. it's like, dude, you're really not. Do you're you really think, not that important to me. <laughs> do you think there's something in me that literally drives women crazy? No. What a narcissist. <laughs> yeah, that's the word I was looking for. Like, dude. He sounds like a putz. I'm yeah. not going to lie. Like, yeah. the whole entire time she was talking about him, I'm like, girl, what are you doing? Mm-hmm. Like, no. He just happens to be in their lives and says in a complete asshat that, like, <laughs> yeah. no. Well, Buddy was the person in her life that was like, okay, well, if I need to do what people want me to do, he's the guy I'm supposed to be with. But she did not want to be with no. him. No. Like, they were no. even on that ski trip that one time, and she ended up breaking her leg or something and it kind of sounded like she meant to do it to get away from him well and, <laughs> and I kind like, of I don't have to go back there again yeah. <laughs> I kind of wonder too if that was maybe a suicide attempt because there's like a really clear like that might have been a suicide attempt where she intentionally broke her leg when I was reading it she was like and then I just pointed myself downward intentionally and went and it felt freeing and great and I was going at great speeds and aiming at like nothing but also it felt like the most freedom I'd ever had or something and 
And then she broke her leg and she knew she couldn't ski because she'd never done it before. Like she had no experience. And, and he was still like, oh, yeah, you can do it. You'll be fine. I know. And then she that. was like, went a completely different direction. But yeah. yeah, I think the most infuriating line in that whole the whole book for me was Buddy asking who she'd marry now since she'd be here. Because like, it's like he thinks that's all she's good for is yeah. marrying someone or that she's somehow damaged because she what received psychiatric treatment. Like, mm-hmm. screw you, buddy. I know it's the 1950s. <laughs> That's not a normal thing to receive because mental health wasn't a thing. And even still, there's a lot of stigma. But Hysterical like, women. What an asshat. <laughs> I was so yeah. mad. I did really enjoy her whole idea of just like, fuck virginity. I just want to like do this and get it out get of the way. Done, yep. <laughs> and I can be free. And I love that Dr. Nolan was like, yes, yes. <laughs> you go get fitted for the contraceptive diaphragm. I'm guessing is what they were using yeah. at the time. Yeah, it was Back in the day. Yep. And then she was like, let's just get rid of this and I'll be over and done with it. And I was like, I Honestly, I feel her. That's kind of how I approached it myself. Mm-hmm. So I was just like, well, I think a lot of girls do. They're like, I just need to get it over with. You know, it's not really like a th- a fun thing or like it's just something you got to check off so that you can move on. Mm-hmm. You know, like th- I think a lot of girls feel that way. And that was very realistic. Find someone you know? halfway decent that you don't fucking hate yeah. and be like, just do it, get it over with and we'll be done and it'll be great and we can move on. So she says, after receiving the diaphragm, I was my own woman. The next step was to find the proper sort of man. Um, and then she, of course, sleeps with Irwin, which turns out to be just an awful encounter um, after spending all that time waiting But my favorite part of that was when she pulled, like, the total power move. Mm -hmm. And sends him the the bill for the hospital incident. And then he asks when he'll see her again. And she's like, no. And she's like, never. Because what a freaking (laughs) bad bitch. Yes. Like, yeah, you need to deal with this. Yes. Yeah, like she, you know what? She wasn't even panicked. It didn't seem like the whole entire time she was hemorrhaging. She's like, "This is probably not normal. Let you need to probably uh, call <laughs> the like, emergency room, Joan." Yeah. Oh, <laughs> so it's just like, "Hey, how are you, Esther?" And she's like bleeding into her yeah. shoe. Well, it's also messed up because it took them a while to find a doctor that would see her too, because mm-hmm. yeah. it was either people wouldn't see her or they realize it was like a period thing and they're like yeah. no i'm not gonna handle that i'm like know? i don't feel like joan really understood the like like how time is the essence is. Yeah. <laughs> yeah yeah how serious it was she's like yeah. i'm hemorrhaging she like poured blood out of a shoe she's like here's my shoe here's yeah. like a bunch of blood on your carpet congratulations <laughs> you won this prize <laughs> Like get some club soda (laughs) and also some more towels because I am still bleeding profusely. Yeah, hemorrhaging, (laughs) hemorrhaging, Joan. Yeah, but yeah, sex was a really major theme in the book. I remember she felt really betrayed because Betty Willard, like, had sex with a waitress, but made it seem like you mean Betty, Betty. Yeah, (laughs) you said Betty. (laughs) Listen, (laughs) Betty. I've had a couple guys. Buddy um, Willard. Buddy Willard. <laughs> Betty Buddy. And he, and he acted like Esther had all the experience. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that was very weird. Yeah. Um, so- also, how dare he? Because he was trying to make her out to be like some kind of like hussy. And mm-hmm. she's like, I literally have done nothing. And she's like literally combing hair over her face so he mm-hmm. can't see her. Yes. And he's the one that like had some affair with this waitress. But I also found the reaction. What a that slut, she, Buddy Willard. <laughs> I also found the reaction she had to be a little odd, but I think that she was more angry about it because he hadn't disclosed the well, fact which that he already had sex yeah. with someone. Um, but at the same time, it just really wasn't the same for men and women then. It wasn't. Now, she did... She did try and act like she had some kind of experience, too, though. But I think it was because she didn't want to seem totally virginal, either. She wanted to Mm -hmm. seem like she had 
some knowledge, but she didn't want to be like, yeah, I've had sex with like the whole football team. <laughs> she wanted to be like, I mean, I've kissed some men. Yeah. Yeah, because she was like, I made out with him for an hour. Like, one, the the ape guy she talked <laughs> yeah. about. The hairy ape guy. And I was like, girl, why? Why are you making out with this ape boy? <laughs> you know what? It ain't no problem if you're hairy. But if you're not attracted to them, you don't have to do it. Just to do it, yeah. Just a yeah. quick shout out. Did you hear that, Ben? <laughs> <laughs> So that one, that one scene with Buddy, whenever, my favorite is like, sometimes Sylvia will throw in like just some comedy gold in the middle of things where you're just like reading like, oh shit. And my oh. favorite was with the Buddy thing where he's like trying to get her to have sex with him and he like stands up and takes his clothes off and she compares his junk to a turkey gizzard. Yes. <laughs> I yes. have the quote right here. <laughs> I forgot oh, about that. That, that was, was my good. favorite. I was like, yes. It says on page 69, actually. <laughs> How fitting. Gold. <laughs> Thank you, Sylvia. <laughs> she said, then he just stood there in front of me and I kept on staring at him. The only thing I could think of was turkey neck and turkey gizzards. And I felt very depressed. <laughs> Girl, same. Sometimes yeah. I've also felt very depressed. Like, <laughs> but as but someone, is she wrong? No. <laughs> as someone that's never seen male anatomy before, uh -huh. like, I feel like that's not an abnormal reaction. No. Like, I'm sorry, guys, but sometimes it's just not very pretty. And, like, especially a woman in, you know, the 50s. Mm -hmm. They're not going to be able to see what the male anatomy looks like until they're basically married, unless they're a so-and-so or floozy. Like, so I was actually very surprised that they they both got naked at that point, right? Yeah. But nothing actually happened. Did oh. they both get naked? I don't think they I did. I don't think she did. He wanted her to because he was, was like, like well, I just know. showed you me. You show me you. And she's like, no. Yeah. I thought I, she I did think. a little bit, but maybe not the whole entire thing. I, I don't remember. Can't recall. just turn to page 69, She was definitely everybody. hesitant about it. Yeah, 69. <laughs> Trying to find this silly thing. It's fine. It's fine. We got time. I'm trashed. <laughs> <laughs> You're trashed. I like how you just, like, whispered it. <laughs> trashed. Trashed. <laughs> oh, but undressing in front of Buddy suddenly appealed to me about as much as having my posture picture taken at college, where you have to stand naked in front of a camera, knowing all the time that a picture of you start naked, both full view and side view, is going to the college gym files to be marked A, B, C, or D, depending on how straight you are. She's scoliosis picture! <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. And she says, oh... Some other time, I said. Yeah, so she, so she didn't, didn't take get up. naked at all. Okay. She's like, so she was thanks like, for the weird turkey gizzards, bro. But yeah, I'm, I'm good. good. <laughs> <laughs> A gobble gobble. <laughs> She's like, I've had enough of this. It's yeah, fine. we're yeah, done. Yeah. <laughs> well, while we're on the subject of the men in this book, or I wouldn't even say men, like the boys in this book, why don't we talk about some more boys? So yeah, there's Buddy. He mm -hmm. is like, honestly, probably not even the worst one, I feel like. No, but he's, he's, he's the quite most. the shite. He's like, like pathetic. He's the least of the worst. I feel like, well, no, besides the Russian and simultaneous interpreter. Yes, yes. He was he's good. probably the second to least, like, yeah. worst. But he's so, like boring no wonder she didn't want to do anything with him yeah. no he's uh, he's a mama's boy too can we just talk Who, buddy? about buddy yeah oh, he's oh, such a oh i have a boy. quote i have a quote before we move on from buddy where the hell is it um <clears throat> this goes very back full to... of himself as well oh yeah he's very yeah, full he of is. himself she writes, and I knew that in spite of all the roses and kisses and restaurant dinners, a man showered on a woman before he married her. What he secretly wanted when the wedding service ended was for her to flatten out underneath him, kind of like Mrs. Willard's kitchen mat, which is his mom. I have a quote about the kitchen mat. Yeah. So oh it's like the whole God. point of Buddy in this book is to be like, 
this is the person you would be with if you wanted to just be complacent and not do anything and do what people wanted you to do. And that's why she doesn't like Buddy. Which is so stereotypical of the time. It yeah. is. So he's really presumptuous. He assumes he's going to be her big love interest. He assumes her feelings for him. He never actually asks her how she feels about him and he assumes that she will someday be his wife asking her while he's sick in a tb ward which seems which like, is some bullshit it's like a weird power move right yes, yes. it is well oh, he wants her to feel sympathy yeah for you'll feel huh? bad for me and say Take yes because i'm so I'm sick. sick yeah 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 what a fucking asshole <laughs> <laughs> sorry <laughs> Uh, yeah, like I just I can't stand Buddy Willie. <laughs> she talked a lot though about what marriage would look like. Um, and we're gonna I'm gonna yeah. talk about Constantine for a minute. Um, she said I tried to imagine what it would be like if Constantine were my husband. It would mean getting up at seven and cooking him eggs and bacon and toast and coffee and dawdling in my nightgown and curlers after he'd left for work to wash up the dirty plates. And to make the bed. And then when he came home after a lively, fascinating day, he'd expect a big dinner and I'd spend the evening washing up even more dirty plates till I fell into bed utterly exhausted. So, like, this is what she kind of views marriage as. And it's like, I'm going to be doting after my husband who's having all this great time that I really, I think she really wants to have this. Mm-hmm. very big agree. career and all this stuff. And she just sees herself as having to marry someone because that's what society expects of her. Even though she says it many times in the book, she doesn't want to get married. Um, she doesn't want to have a bunch of kids. Well, and also Sylvia Plath, like whenever that was an option she had her time. two kids, that was, they're pretty young whenever her and, Ted split. She was much and younger than Ted. And she was living Ted. by herself with these two kids and the power was going out all the fucking time during this one really bad winter. Or it was the wor- it was the second worst winter in London since yeah. like the 1800s or some crap like that. So I thought about that when I was reading parts of the Bell Jar cuz I especially this parts about being a mom and stuff. There's this quote from Hold on. Oh, here it is. Page 66 and she's talking about uh labor. And she says, I thought it sounded just like the sort of drug a man would invent. Here was a woman in terrible pain, obviously feeling every bit of it, or she wouldn't groan like that. And she would go straight home and start another baby because the drug would make her forget how bad the pain had been. When all the time, in some secret part of her, that long, blind, doorless, and windowless corridor of pain was waiting to open up and shut her in again. How easy having babies seemed to the women around me. Why was I so unmaternal and apart? If I had to wait on a baby all day, I would go mad. Same. Me too, girl. Me too. That's a direct quote. (laughs) Direct quote. Um, And then she talks about... She talks about one of her neighbors a lot, Dodo Conway. Do you guys remember? Yes. Yes. Dodo just constantly has all these babies and she kind of weird acts like a dodo yeah Yeah. but she also kind of weird admires dodo in a weird Mm -hmm. there's like a very strange admiration of because she's kind of like no one and then she's the weird one in the neighborhood and she's like she's like sees herself they're still better off than everybody else it's really odd it is a very strange association it's like she's like I could never have that many kids, but also I weird admire the fact that she has so many kids and like makes it. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> There's a really strange relationship she has with Dodo. And like, she's not mentioned much, but when she is, she's either like being picked upon for having so many kids or admired for her maternal instincts. It's so. Or just like marry into a good family because her mm-hmm. husband yep. does something that they like actually have money yes. yes and it talks about that like vehicle that's almost like a hearse cadillac yeah but at the same time not it's a station wagon and i'm like i don't know how to feel about this mm-hmm. so is that is that like Your death of femininity because you just have a bunch of fucking babies well, i was gonna say is that like a like 
metaphor for the way she would feel about being a mother. Like it would just mm, be mm-hmm. the end of me if I had so many damn kids. I feel like she thinks of herself, if she had a bunch of kids, if Esther had a bunch of kids, she would be Dodo What's-Her-Face. You know what I mean? Dodo Conway. Yeah, that's her Dodo, name. Dodo what's her face? <laughs> like, cause she probably, she's like, if I didn't have kids, that would be me. Yep. But, and then she hates that, you know? Yeah, I mean, and I could definitely see that because she talks about how much it looks like a freaking hearse. Yeah, yeah. Yep. Do you guys remember too that weird scene in the maternity ward? Not the one where she goes to visit and sees the baby being born. The flowers? The flowers. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. She's like trying so she's to, yeah, like explain trying what's going to, on. She tries to help the other mother. Like, so there's all these women and she's like supposed to deliver the flowers to these women. But she notices that some of them are kind of droopy and sad sack or little just flowers. Dead, yeah. yeah. And she's like, if I was on the maternity ward and just had a baby, I sure as shit wouldn't want like these sad sack flowers delivered to my room. How depressing. And so she's like really thoughtful and mixes them all up so that all of the mothers have like a nice bouquet. But then she delivers them, and the moms are total bitches about it, and they're like, "Where are my special? You ruined my flowers. my lock spurs." And she was trying to make them better, and she yeah. was, and then she like fucks off. There's she is so Iris is in my yellow roses. Yes, yes. which ew, Iris. Where are my petunias? But <gasps> they were my. Babies. Are they really? <laughs> they smell like pee. <laughs> Wait, they're huh? just beautiful. They, I think they smell. What like are pee. they? What? Irises, I think, smell oh. like pee. I think irises are just beautiful. But they don't smell like anything. I think they smell like pee. <laughs> There's some kind You're of weird. Maybe, <laughs> pee on my Maybe they did. <laughs> anyway, anyway, but but like she delivers them, and she's like horrified that all these mothers have this big outlashing, and she just fucks off. She leaves as fast as she She's can. like, fuck this outfit. I'm done. She Which, like throws it in with a dead flower. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I'm pretty sure that's actually what leads into the whole thing with her father's grave. I think that's when she goes to, to do that, if I remember right. And she's like, oh my God, the maternity ward bitches right. hate me. Yeah. And she leaves and asks about the jail and then goes to visit her father's grave. It's really weird. So I think we should go back to the boys in the book. Yes. We're talking about Constantine. Let's okay. talk about who totally... Constantine is because I don't think we've actually said who this character is. He so, was my favorite. Yeah. I'm not going to lie. He yeah. was so sweet. So Constantine is like the... He's a translator that knew Mrs. Willard but apparently, you know, didn't know her... Like, he didn't like her either. And so... <laughs> so that, does? That made him even more likable to Esther, who is, I think, a likable character as well. Honestly, for her, Constantine would have been her best bet. And... But also, at the same time, he was too... Too timid, too gentle. So here's my thought. So we'll talk about Marco here in a minute. Oh, uh, fuck, yeah, fuck Marco. Yeah, fuck Marco. Marco. But I did a compare and contrast of Constantine and Marco. And here's my opinion on Constantine. So I think that Esther had really bad opinions of herself. She's very depressed. I would agree. And as a female who's had very poor impressions of my own self, whenever I got into relationships, I did not think that I deserved whatever good thing was being presented to me. And I think that's what Constantine is to her. And she said, I thought if only I had a keen, shapely bone structure to my face or could discuss politics shrewdly or as a famous writer, Constantine might find me interesting enough to sleep with me. Which, like I said, it's like she thinks she's not pretty or smart enough. Mm -hmm. Um, And then at the end, though, Constantine asked if her hair was always like that. And he reached out and he put his hand at the root of her hair and he ran his fingers out slowly to the tips like a comb. To me, to he's me, interesting. Yeah, yeah, he's very interested. Yeah. It's romantic. It's sweet. I'm touching you, therefore I'm interested. Yes, like, but she doesn't see she doesn't it know. that way. Yeah. yeah, She has too poor of a like... Yeah. Self-esteem, yeah. self-image. So, she definitely have a self-esteem thing and I think Sylvia Plath did too because, mm-hmm. I mean, she had that pseudonym Victoria Lucas for the bell jar because she literally didn't think it was worth she didn't think it was good she, she didn't, didn't think it had literary value she questioned its literary value and did not believe it was serious work yeah, yeah. which is like that is portrayed that's in so Esther sad. where it's like okay this person doesn't want to sleep with me right now I'm a horrible person no that's not how it is 
that's a respectful man. And then there we was, have Marco. We got Marco. There's Marco. We There's, also have Lenny. There was one. Bef- there it was Lenny's friend. I can't remember. Who was his super name. short, and she was like, "I ain't having and that." And he wore a blue oh, suit and disgust. Well, <laughs> Lenny was the one that was. <laughs> You can just see it, like the gross, like really unbreathable. She's fabric. like, I just can't stand a man in a blue suit. <laughs> Lenny was the one that he would be like a used car salesman yes. or something or whatever, yes. you know? Like he he didn't play that big of a role, but he was the one that um, he had that snake grin. What's her face? Uh, Doreen. Yeah, Doreen. Doreen's. Doreen like wanted to hook up with him and so Esther like tagged along with him for a little bit and yeah his little short friend she was like nah yes. <laughs> I don't even and that's when they were drinking the daiquiris I think because he one? wasn't no, Marco, important Marco was the daiquiris oh Marco was the daiquiris she yes. had a, a vodka tonic I think with the them. other guy oh. yeah Hinsar. blue suit that's how we're drink. gonna call him because I don't remember his name because he blue was suit. not important well, no. Lydia was not important that I just remember was he important. was short and she was like no I'm just gonna put some quotes out here about Marco. So he's really rough with her. He leaves bruises. There's like this thing where he grabs her arm and he leaves bruises like fingerprints on her arm. And then he orders her drinks for her. He doesn't ask what she'd like. He just insists on dancing. Um, And he, there's this quote that says, he gripped my hand in such a way I had to choose between following him onto the floor or having my arm torn off it's a tango marco maneuvered me out among the dancers i love tangos well i can't dance you don't have to dance i'll do the dancing then he said pretend you're drowning so page 109 when he's like literally trying to rape her he like threw her down the ground in the mud and she's like it's happening I thought, it's happening. If I just lie here and do nothing, it will happen. And Marco set his teeth to the strap of my shoulder and tore my sheath to the waist. I saw the glimmer of bare skin like a pale veil separating two bloody-minded adversaries. Slut, the word hissed by my ear. Slut. So it's like, she's like, well, if I just do whatever he wants to do, it'll just happen. I'll get it over with. Get it over Ugh. with because yeah. you know how she's been so like ambiguous about sexuality. She's just like it's a thing that I just want to get done and over with. Whatever. She doesn't necessarily like Marco, but at the same time, she's like, eh, you know, yeah. I guess if he's gonna do it, he's gonna do it. But then, like at the same time, she realizes later after he's been like calling her slut and pushing her down into the mud she's like the dust cleared and i had a full view of the battle and then i began to writhe and bite yes yes yeah so i feel like she might have been complacent in the beginning but then she was like no fuck fuck. This. yeah, yeah. <laughs> it was like no <laughs> i don't remember if this was in the book or i know it was in the movie that we're going to talk about later but after she <laughs> fights him off, she takes his blood because she has blood on her, and she puts yes. it on her face, like at, in like warrior paint. Yeah, and I was like, Dude. it was in the book too. That definitely. was like really powerful for me because I was like, yeah, and she, she left owned it there. She owned him. Like she, that was like her her brand to be like, this is what I did. I am not sorry. The you whole know? train ride back. She like on the way back. Yeah, true. Yeah, she wore it, and that was the thing that I said earlier. She made sure not to like smile, so it wouldn't crack and flake off. Yeah, which is so. Yeah, that was her makeup. That was her makeup. I wanted to talk about that because she was very proud. She was very proud of that. That was that thing that earlier I talked about with the mom. She asked about the blood, and then she told her you failed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and and she just dismissed whatever like Esther Happened. said yep. she was like oh okay you just cut yourself fine whatever yeah. but you failed like, by I the way <laughs> well, and I also feel like Marco was the breaking point for her like because after Marco she went home and then that's whenever she really started kind of derailing you know so mm-hmm. I always think of Marco as like being like he's kind of like a catalyst yeah the catalyst of like okay I'm going home I don't feel good home being at home and then all this other stuff. I don't I didn't enjoy this experience because all these other things happened. It was really shitty for all multiple 
like a reasons. And now I'm back home with my mother that I don't even want to spend time with. <laughs> yeah. Like, wow. One thing we do need to talk about yes. is, I mean, the title of the book is The Bell Jar. We need to talk about what that bell jar actually is. Represents. And, and she talks a lot about it at the end of the book. Yeah. The, yeah, she doesn't talk about it hardly at all in the beginning. The first time it is referenced in this copy is page 185. I was going to say, it's like really close to the end because the mm -hmm. book is only... I'm go, like, I'm it's not it. that long, really. It's 244 pages. And yep. the first time she references it at 185, and I want to say it's only referenced like... Two, three, two, three times. Three times in the whole mm -hmm. book. So Go I have. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So. I'm trashed. Um, <laughs> I'm trashed. <laughs> Amber is trashed, everyone. <laughs> Amber is trashed. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> for um, animal skulls. So. Yeah, isn't that basically, I wonder if she, this is just me thinking about Sylvia and her father. Her father did bee stuff and other things with preserving animals. Do you think that she got that from there? It's very possible. It could be. It's also a really great way to and save cheese. So this is a quote from Sylvia Plath about the bell jar. Like, not the book, but what the bell jar means. What I've done is throw together events from my own life, fictionalizing to add color. It's a pot boiler, really, but I think it will show how isolated a person feels when he or she is suffering a breakdown. I've tried to picture my world and the people in it as seen through this distorting lens of a bell jar. And then she was actually supposed to write another book. That's the one she probably burned. One. It's possible. That Heartbreaking. She was going to talk about, like, um, it, viewing from the outside into the bell jar, it was supposed to be like a butter thing, like outside the bell jar. Oh, and interesting. Like, but she obviously did so it. So I did not get to that point. So a couple quotes about the bell jar that I want to include. One is, "I would be sitting under the same glass bell jar, stewing in my own sour air," which is very like. Very specimen y and like mm -hmm. claustrophobic y, you know? Mm -hmm. The other one is the bell jar hung suspended a few feet above my head. I was open to the circulating air. So that's like when she's about, she could feel she's almost there, you know? Yeah, it's like at the end where she's almost to the point of being released from the asylum and she's like, I can just freaking taste it. Yeah. And yeah. she's trying to do what she's supposed to do. So she can get out. But I wasn't sure. I wasn't sure at all. How did I know that someday at college in Europe, somewhere, anywhere, the bell jar with its stifling distortions wouldn't descend, descend again? Mm -hmm. So like she knows she's out from under it. Right now. But she also understands that at any given time, it could just like come down on her mm -hmm. you know yeah I feel and like, that's how depression works anyway yeah i was like i feel like that's very much how any kind of mental illness works you're really good for a moment and then you're not so yeah. like yeah this is yeah. one of the most beautiful and well described like metaphors for depression that i've seen in a while because that is kind of exactly what it's like. It's like you're just stuck and you don't know how you're ever going to escape it. And even when you finally do, you're like, but is it going to come right back? I mean, it's going to happen whenever you least expect it. Exactly. There's a couple things I would like to talk about. Yes. One from the actual book, The Bell Jar, where the first time she has... Uh, electroshock therapy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. And she's talking about how she's positioned and Dr. Gordon is doing these things and she's seeing these lights and everything, which later on Dr. Nolan is like, you should not have seen or experienced yeah. any of those things. Yeah. But 
at this point, before she's ever meeting Dr. Nolan. Which she, we should clarify who Dr. Nolan is. She is a female a psychiatrist. Female psychiatrist. Yep. And the first psychiatrist she met with, she hated him. Mm-hmm. He was like, not great. And she actually trusts Dr. Nolan. Yes. yes. And honestly, I have a very similar experience in that, like, the first couple um, psychiatrists or, you know, therapists that I talked to were men, and I did not, mm-hmm. I did not have a feeling of trust with them. I did not feel like I could relate to them. So, like, I, I totally understand where she's coming from in this instance. And she's specifically says, this is a direct quote from the bell jar, I wondered what terrible thing it was that I had done. And I feel like everyone who's had an instance of mental illness, whether it's fleeting or if it's like consistent, everyone has wondered, what have I done that is so bad that I am just cursed with this affliction? Mm-hmm. And I feel like that was like, One of the biggest things for me that had come across, it was just like wondering, what did I do? Mm -hmm. And I feel like that's a pretty normal thing to look internally and be like, blame yourself for this. But it has nothing necessarily to do with any actions that we've done. It's literally just brain chemistry. And we cannot control that on our own. Mm Mm-hmm. And I think that's, like, a really important thing to actually discuss. And then on 147, she talks about how she wanted to commit suicide in a warm bath with, you know, cutting her wrists. But then the the quote from the book that really, like, kind of stood out to me was, but when it came right down to it... The skin of my wrist looked so white and defenseless that I couldn't do it. It was as if what I wanted to kill wasn't in that skin or the thin blue pulse that jumped under my thumb, but somewhere else deeper, more secret, and a whole lot harder to get at. Mm-hmm. And I feel like that's a really eloquent way of describing mental health. Mm -hmm. It's like we might try to damage our outer self, but really internally it's the deepest part of ourselves that we can never actually get to. Girl, that's really deep. (laughs) No no pun intended. That's very deep. Yeah. Yeah. No, I actually had that quote in my notes too, because specifically because the way that Sylvia writes about suicide is very, it's like kind of matter of factly in a way. And that was one of the quotes I had. I also had one where she was. I think it was something she saw in the newspaper or something about a guy that jumped off a building. And she wrote, the trouble about jumping was that if you didn't pick the right number of stories, you might still be alive when you hit bottom. I thought seven stories must be a safe distance. So the way that she thinks about it is like very practical. Yes, very much so. She talks about death in so many instances. She's in... (sighs) Is- There's this really humorous scene in the book that's not supposed to be humorous <laughs> at all, where she takes the like um belt of her mother's bathrobe. The yellow silk belt of her bathrobe. Yes. Yes, that and was she very ties specific. It around thing. her neck. And she just like walks around the house and like I can just imagine trying this. to find like areas that she can use it. And from. this just fucking belt just trailing behind her. And yeah. like it's not humorous, but when you think about that image, it's maybe a little humorous. It's not funny. It's sad. It's tragic. She's trying to kill herself. That is Or think sad. she's thoroughly thinking about it. Yes, yeah, definitely. But she can't find a place to get this to where she can actually do it. She keeps comparing her house need- to her grandmother's yes. house who would have had options mm. to do that. Which is so yeah. sad. Yeah, and there's like this scene where she's talking to this boy on the beach. Cal. Yes. 
And she's talking to him and she's like, how would you kill yourself if you were to do it? And she was so disappointed when she was like, he was like, I would shoot myself. She was so disappointed in that answer. But um, also excited. Yeah. Because he would, had actually thought about, thought about it. it. Yeah. And, and it so, was a weird someone to talk conversation. About yes. Yeah. yeah. But she was like, I'll I'll swim out with you and like race you to that thing over there. And he's like, you're crazy. And she's like, yeah. And so <laughs> he's like, I'm let tired. I'm not yeah. doing that. And so she tries to swim out as far as she possibly and can. And she still didn't make it. In hopes that she drowned. And she's like, but the sea She spat tried to drown me. herself. She did. And she's like, but the sea spat me back out. And I'm like, damn. Yeah. It's buoyancy, bitch. That's what happens. Yes. Mm-hmm. And then, <laughs> unless you actually swallow a lot of water, you're not going to do just drown. And then, of course, she did. She did try to commit suicide yeah. with pills, um, which is how she did try to in real life. Do in it. that yeah. instance that she went into the psych ward. Which can I say? Okay, so she found like. A wall or like some kind of hidden space in her parents' home, <laughs> the alcove or her mom's or home, whatever. to overdose on pills. So this was not a cry for help like the jail thing was with her dad. She actually wanted to do this, and this is how it happened in real, real life. I know. Yeah. And not only did she do this, where she crawled up underneath the crawl space and found this tiny little alcove. When she was talking about it, she was so excited to do it. Do you remember how excited she was to end her life? She was like, I'm taking these pills one by one. She's like, she I, was very she, into it. She wrote the letter to her mother that said she was going on a long walk. And she was like, and then I was getting ready to go do it. And then I realized that I forgot the most important part. And I laughed about it. And she dressed in nice clothes. Yeah. Mm, yeah. And she was like, bye, everybody. She like, was She was ready, ready to go. Yes. And I know this from experience. You don't think about the impact that you're going to have on other people when you do it. You're so in the moment of my life is miserable. I'm unhappy and I'm not helping any of the people around me. No one really wants me here that you really think that and you check out and you just go. It's not something that you do because you're being malicious. You go because you feel like nobody wants you there. That that's how it is it's not like that but that's how you feel and so you do it you Mm -hmm. act on that emotion that you're having at that moment (sighs) excuse me i have many things to drink um oh my god the hiccups you um, sound like Dumbo when he got into the booze. <laughs> I see elephants. I see elephants flying around. Elephants in the pink. No, no. Uh, Sorry. No, Sorry. It's fine. One of the other relationships we needed to talk about was Joan. It's funny because the way that Esther talks about homosexuality is very juvenile. I it feel is. like. And And she's like, I don't even see what other women see in each other. And Dr. Nolan had a really good response to this. She said gentleness. Mm -hmm. And I really liked that. Yeah, because it's like, that's what you gravitate to when you cannot, like, find anything else. Like, if. Yeah, not that that's the only reason. No. To to have, you know. But it's, it's interesting that, like, Joan definitely had feelings for Esther and then. Whenever Esther she, was really juvenile about it, and and actually Joan actually mimicked Esther a lot in ways because mm-hmm. Esther tried to commit suicide, Joan tried to commit suicide, then Esther got into this facility, then Joan got into this facility. So it's kind of like said, this weird thing where Joan was following her around, and I think that's the main reason why Esther did not like that. It wasn't that. She had feelings for her. It was the fact that she was kind of replicating that. Yes. But you could tell that Esther saw a lot of herself in Joan and mm-hmm. what she was representing. Sometimes I wondered if I had made Joan up. Other times I wondered if she would continue to pop up in every crisis of my life to remind me of what I had been and what I had been through 
and carry on her own separate but similar crisis under my nose. So Joan actually does commit suicide in the book. She um, Mm -hmm. hangs herself by a lake. And after she makes advances on Esther. Yeah. She's at Joan's funeral and she goes through all this stuff. And I remember there's this line about it. Um, And all during the simple funeral service, I wondered what I thought I was burying. I think it's a positive thing. I think we've come to a realization that that Belger has lifted, that we're doing well. No, of course, we all know how her life actually ended. But I think that at the end of this book. Which is a fictional character. Which is a fictional character based upon her life. Yes. (laughs) I do think that at that point in time, Sylvia thought, and I like that we call her Sylvia like she's a friend of ours because she feels (laughs) like a friend of ours. Yes, after these months of reading. Yes. That the bell jar has truly lifted and that maybe, possibly, potentially, she could actually succeed in her life. And do well and feel better. And I feel like she really felt that. But of course, we know how it ends for her. Also, just gonna read you this from her diaries. Okay. (laughs) And if you have no past or future, which after all is all the present is made of, why then you may as well dispose of the empty shell of present and commit suicide. But the cold reasoning mass of gray entrail and the cranium which parrots, I think, therefore I am, whispers that there is always the turning, the upgrade, the new slant. And so I wait. What avail are good looks to grab temporary security? Aww. Hmm. What's that quote from? It's the oh. journals of Sylvia Plath. Um, and it's basically the unabridged. So finally, after Ted Hughes died, he yeah. his estate allowed the unabridged journals because he kept them yeah. kind of secret. But he probably didn't want to be because he's possible. a dick. <laughs> anyway, he probably didn't want to be held responsible for any yep. of the shit he did. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so we're gonna end this episode with uh, kind of like the media movie adaptation of the book, The Bell Jar. So there was a 1979 adaptation of this book, the only movie that has been released so far. Um, I could not even find it streaming. I had to find it on YouTube. <laughs> uh, starring Marilyn Hassett as Esther and Julia Harris as her mom. I do want to say that Marilyn Hassett was 32 years old whenever she was playing Esther. Like which the 19-year-old? I'm like, dude, that's probably not the greatest thing ever because like, she sounded like, a sultry woman, you know, like. But it- that's really typical too. <laughs> Can we just talk about how typical that is? It's like, ooh, it's like you are definitely not a college age student, Hello. you know. I'm Esther Greenwood, a no. typical young college student. Yeah. No, you're not. <laughs> <laughs> like, calm down. You've yeah. had you've you've lived your life. Yes. But- Um, It was directed by Larry Pierce, which I don't know who that person is, but I would say that this movie should probably be directed by someone that's a woman or someone that identifies as a woman because (laughs) it's just a book that needs to have that. And I think that's one of its downfalls. You know, Um, the biggest thing that he did, he had two episodes that he directed that were touched by an angel. Oh, good for him. Yeah, which I never There's so watched, much but it was like a thing in the 90s. So he directed two episodes of Touch by Angel. Not to take anything away from him, but he probably should have had more experience to do this film. Good for you, Larry Pierce. Good for so you, Larry anyway, Pierce. <clears throat> so that's the whole premise. 
Uh, I'm not going to go too much into this because it's really not that great of a movie. It had, I'm telling you, a 0% on Rotten Tomatoes. So I actually have um, a couple reviews I want to read to you. <laughs> okay, let's hear and it. And this is going to be, they could describe it way better than I could. This is a 1 out of 10 star on IMDb. This is the lowest rating you can give. It's titled <laughs> An Abomination by Ain't Been To No Music School. <laughs> I like it. In February 26, 2006. Okay. Here's what they have to say. This is the worst film i have ever seen i looked into it mainly out of morbid curiosity since i love the novel and i wish i hadn't i turned it off after a little less than an hour though i wanted to turn it off after five minutes i wish i had it disregards the novel a lot and changes all sorts of factors Unless the film manages to redeem itself in less than 50 or so minutes, which would be impossible, I would in no way recommend this. It's an insult to one of the greatest writers, writers of the 20th century. I don't think as many people say that it is that the bell jar is necessarily unfilmable, but this particular rendition could have been done without I'd almost like to see this one duh. One day. I'd almost like to see this one day in the hands of a director and screenwriter who can do it justice. So that's basically, I mean, you don't have to watch the movie. That's what it is. That is what it is. So here is the one good review that I found, and I had to I had to include it just because the pizzazz. Title. Marilyn Hassett gives a great performance by Forrest 136, June 23rd, 2001. Remember seeing this film years ago and it had a lasting impression on me. I remember the wonderful performance of Marilyn Hassett on Esther and Julia Harris as her mother. The breakdown of the main character was horrifying and so well acted. I wish this was an uh, I wish this was on video. Whatever happened to Marilyn Hassett, she had a real promising career. And what beautiful hair! Okay. <laughs> so the main thing was like her hair was beautiful. That's I think the main thing. Was a little That's the main thing. Marilyn yeah, Hassett. I think so. Yeah, that was the only the only review that I saw that was like, "Yep, okay, it was good." <laughs> so there's been talk for a while, and it looks like it kind of died in 2019. That there would maybe be an adaptation um, of one of the Fannings. I have it all written down. So Okay. So what happened was um, Julia Stiles was going to direct it. Okay. And then Dakota Fanning was going to play Esther. Well, that would have been good. Yeah. I think that would have been good. That fell apart. Aww. And then... Um, Kirsten what's Dunst? Her face? Kirsten Dunst was going to play... Or was going to direct with Dakota Fanning and it still has not gone anywhere. Well, so in 2019 it said Kirsten Dunst was no longer going to be directing it. So it, yeah. it's a real bummer because I, I feel like it is a hard thing to put into perspective though. I think, but it could be, but I think it could be done. There's been, it has to be a female director. though. It for has sure. to be. There's been some, or at least someone with an idea of what female perspective is. This is a beautiful book. Yeah. And I think that's the so thing. It's so ahead of its, it's time. It's so, I think that's the thing is like people, it's, it's a book that has been solidified in American and British history. So. At this point, nobody wants to do it injustice. Well, yeah, they, they're they scared, I yeah. think is really what it is. Which, good for you, Sylvia Plath, for like making, creating a book that people are scared to actually adapt. <laughs> she is a beautiful writer, and we are all just, it is such a misfortune that she ended her life so tragically and early, and also that she burnt Probably what is one of the more beautiful books that she could have written mm -hmm. about mental health and wellness after the fact. I think 
having both views from the same person yeah. is actually mm -hmm. really important. And I also okay. give another quotation from her unabridged diary. Oh, yes, yes of girl, I hate. Of course you can. And when at last you find someone to whom you feel you can pour out your soul, you stop and shock at the words you utter. They are so rusty, so ugly, so meaningless and feeble from being kept in the small, cramped, dark inside you so long. Yes, there is joy, fulfillment, and companionship, but the loneliness of the soul and its appalling self-consciousness is horrible and overpowering. Fuck. Damn. <laughs> like, <laughs> our increased use of language also indicates our level of drunkenness. <laughs> <laughs> it's so good, though. Sorry for yeah, the filth, no. but we're drunk. For the first episode, I think we tackled a very hard book. And I, I think, think we did. I think, I think we, we did. did it well. I think we did it justice. I think we did too. I think we did. All right. Well, we'll see you next month with our discombobulated book club because that's what we are. Yep. Love you all. Bye bye. Audio engineering, logo creation, and social media content was produced by Lauren Ranney with Ranney Film and Video. Stock music tracks have been provided by Motion Array. Find us on Facebook and Instagram at Liquor Literature Podcast, where you can dive into more details about the books, authors, and movies we cover. You can find all of our episodes at liquorliteraturepodcast.podbean.com. Until next time, keep the pages turning and the drinks flowing. Hi fans, just so you're aware, um, another tool for your tool belt. I run a suicide prevention and mental health awareness campaign called Socktober. You can find it on Facebook, but basically we hand out socks in the month of October with a message of mental health awareness um, and how to kind of help cope. It's a little coping mechanism thing um, to help with depression and that is called Socktober. So if you're interested, please go over to the Facebook page, check us out. And we're hoping to help plenty of people with depression and maybe prevent a couple suicides. Thanks. Have a great day.